Welcome everyone, greetings. Welcome to the Florida Mental Health Council Association webinar entitled Overview of Sex Therapy and Diagnosis of Dysfunctional of Sexual Dysfunction and Disorders with Dr. Richard Siegel. This is the fourth webinar in our annual series in 2019 Emerging Issues in Mental Health Counseling webinar series. My name is Diana. I'm the executive director of FAMCA and I will be your monitor today. Now, I'd like to collect some information about you, our audience, for our presenter by launching some polls. So I'm going to launch the, the first poll here. Please select which of the following learning objectives are you most interested in learning about today? Okay, so Based off of everyone's answer, we see that number four, the fourth learning objective, describe treatment and interventions for sexual disorders, is what primarily everyone is, well, 67% of you are most interested in learning about today, as well as 22% of you had shared, explain the practice of sex therapy. Now I'm going to launch another poll for you to get a little bit more of an idea as to who our audience is today. Which of the following describes you? So we see that 60% of those on our webinar this afternoon are licensed mental health counselors um, or LMFTs or licensed clinical social workers. We also have 25% who are currently counseling students and 10% who are registered interns. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Richard Siegel. He is the director of Modern Sex Therapy Institutes and a postgraduate continuing education institute that trains sex therapists and sexual medicine specialist at multiple sites throughout the country. Dr. Siegel is in Florida and is a licensed mental health counselor, a board certified sex therapist, and is certified by the American Association of Sexual Educators, Counselors, and Therapists as a sex therapist and is a sex therapist and supervisor. He has rich, rich experimental background, including over 25 years working in sexual education and addiction treatment, teaching on college campuses and maintaining a private sex therapy practice. Dr. Siegel has completed his doctoral dissertation at the American Academy of Clinical um, Psychologists in Orlando, Florida with research on sexual issues in addiction, treatment, and recovery. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Richard Siegel. Okay, Diana, thank you very much for that introduction and for uh, reading my bio. I'm really happy to be with you today, uh, actually out on the West Coast and on the Pacific Northwest and missing Florida. Uh, driving my daughter cross country for a big move, but uh, I'm happy that I can be with you talking about uh, uh, clearly my favorite subject. I will say up front that I uh, cop to having a bias when it comes to talking about sexuality. Um, I understand that we all have our specialties and no one can be a specialist in everything, uh, but my particular bias um, brings some frustration uh, when uh, I see that most therapists are working with individuals and couples in particular uh, and actively, well, many are actively avoiding the discussion of sexuality, which to me, uh, you know, again, with that bias in mind, uh, working with couples and not talking about sexuality, I often say is akin to a plumber that doesn't do toilets. And clearly none of us would tolerate that. Imagine, especially, you know, three in the morning is usually when plumbing problems happen and you have to pay the 24 hour uh, fees, but uh, none of us would tolerate a, a plumber coming to our house in, in crisis, right? We don't think about our toilets unless they're not working and saying, oh no, sorry, I don't do toilets. I, 
only do sinks and showers and have to refer you to a specialist plumber if you need toilet work. We, we wouldn't accept it. We'd say, get out, get out of the plumbing profession, go do something else because plumbing, you know, toilets are critical to the work of plumbers. And similarly, I believe that sexuality is core and critical to working with couples. Uh, a dear friend and colleague from Connecticut, Tammy Nelson, some of you may be familiar with her writing or her training. Uh, she talks about how she always asks every couple in the very first session about sexuality issues, even if they're not presenting for that. Uh, very often in my own practice, I, I uh, bring that up as part of my assessment. And sometimes couples will say, oh, no, we're not, uh, we're not here for that. We're just here for, uh, you know, we fight all the time. And, and I will say, you know, I understand that, but please indulge me. It's part of my diagnostic process, and it kind of gives me a snapshot into um, the current status, the health of the relationship, and uh, entirely what's going on. So uh, I do have to uh, also apologize up front. Uh, there seems to have been a mistake in one of the objectives that most of you picked as your strongest interest, but this presentation is really focused more on uh, diagnosis and assessment and not so much on treatment. That would be a whole other uh, workshop, but I certainly will be touching upon treatment um, in some of the uh, overview slides on sex therapy and sexual dysfunction, uh, particularly, again, when it comes to working with couples, because as we'll see on one of the slides, it's very common for uh, one person to have some sexual dysfunction and that cause a secondary uh, dysfunction in the partner. And that might sound a little confusing, but it'll make perfect sense. I'm sure you'll all understand um, what I mean Sometimes it can bounce back and forth where you have multiple dysfunctions, uh, secondary, tertiary, et cetera, uh, as a result of the presenting problem. Now, um, I do also want to say by way of preface that, of course, we know we are all trained in a disease model. It's pretty difficult to get uh, uh, reimbursed by insurance, for example, if we don't have a diagnosis. Even the old school marriage and family therapists who used to say, no, no, we're systemic. We don't believe in a pathologizing approach. Uh, we don't like pathological labels until they realized that even they couldn't get paid. So uh, for better or, or worse, we are sort of forced to work in a disease model. We need to see a syndrome, a collection of symptoms uh, uh, as delineated in DSM. Uh, or uh, ICD for more medical professionals. And if criteria are met, we make the diagnosis and that in effect labels someone with a, uh, a psychopathology. And that kind of sticks in the craw of most sex therapists since we generally tend to have a more sex positive outlook and try and uh, normalize as much as possible and telling someone that their sexuality is diseased or broken doesn't sit well with most uh, most of us sex therapists. Uh, further than that, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, kind of the uh, cliches or most common stereotypes about sex therapy, most notably the sensate focus behavioral assignments that Masters and Johnson designed after uh, they uh, kind of discovered uh, what happens to humans, uh, human bodies during sexual arousal. And I will show you, if you haven't seen, uh, look ahead in the slides, I'll show you some different models of sexual response as part of our overview. And it's just stunning to me, even after all these years in the field, that this work was done uh, in my lifetime. I was born in 63, and Masters and Johnson didn't publish this data until 66. And when you consider how long we've been studying anatomy and physiology and, and medicine, you know, for, for millennia, it seems. Certainly uh, long enough ago uh, until, you know, to the days of, of uh, da Vinci and Michelangelo drawing anatomical uh, uh, diagrams, primarily from cadavers, by the way. A lot of people aren't aware of that little trivia, may not be so comfortable with it. 
Uh, but we've been studying our bodies for, for centuries, and it's pretty clear that we know just about everything there is to know about, say, for example, how our gastrointestinal system works or our cardiovascular system. But when it comes to uh, sexuality, very often there, there tends to be still this kind of wild, wild west, both among mental uh, and medical health uh, providers uh, either. There's a sense that um, it's outside our wheelhouse if we're not trained specifically, so we would refer, uh, or even, as we'll see in some of the slides, the what would seem to most people as the most natural go-to providers for sexual problems, urologists for guys, even though, of course, women have urological systems and needs as well, but we all know that the go-to physician for women's, uh, women's issues, quote unquote, is typically the gynecologist. Uh, however, urologists and gynecologists uh, seldom, if ever, have any training in sexuality, and uh, often they're just as uncomfortable, if not more so, uh, being asked questions uh, when it comes to patients' sexuality. There was a survey done many years ago, I believe it was Procter & Gamble, uh, where they found that the number one answer patients gave for not asking their provider about a sexual issue or a sexual problem uh, was fear of embarrassing the provider, which I'm sure we would all agree is pretty ludicrous since uh, the provider is supposed to be the one uh, uh, worrying about the patient's well-being. And, and uh, we shouldn't have patients afraid to ask us questions for fear of uh, our own discomfort. We certainly need to be open. So uh, again, that bias tells me that sexuality should be part of the uh, uh, repertoire for uh, all of us in assessing uh, even common variety, uh, garden variety issues like anxiety and depression. Uh, very often they are either associated with sexual problems or cause sexual problems uh, or lead to uh, sexual problems lead to uh, other things like depression and anxiety or relationship conflict. It's also fair to say that uh, many, if not most, uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm putting air quotes around sexual problems that may present in our office are really not uh, sexual dysfunctions, but relational issues. And as I'm sure most of us know, uh, sex very often takes the hit when there are uh, relationship problems. Uh, high conflict couples, um, values, dis values conflicts, uh, desire discrepancies, all of these kinds of things that we will touch upon today. So uh, uh, as Diana mentioned before, uh, please uh, don't hesitate. If you have any questions, type them up there in the control panel and Diana will let me know that there's questions. It certainly doesn't need to be uh, an hour and a half of me talking at you. It could, uh, it could be a little interactive, especially if there's something I say that uh, raises more questions for you or if you require some further explanation. So with that, I'm just going to switch the screen to the slides. You should still be able to see me in a little box there. Let's see. I am seeing. Okay, great. So as you see there from the title and the beautiful picture of Palm Beach, which I'm missing terribly, uh, we're going to cover an overview of sex therapy and the diagnosis of sexual dysfunctions and disorders. Um, so sex therapy as a modality in and of itself, if I can, okay. Um, as I said, started proper or formally with Masters and Johnson's work in the late 50s and early 60s into the mid 60s into the 70s, they continued. Uh, but first, and, and as I mentioned, most uh, surprisingly, uh, only fairly recently within the past 50 something years, uh, the, most famous model, there were others that, that predated, of course, uh, but the most famous and what's considered the most complete uh, model of sexual response uh, included these phases. Uh, desire, uh, the, uh, uh, what typically most people refer to as feeling horny, or the sense of sexual tension, sexual desire, and just like any other tension, tension seeks to be uh, released, relieved, 
So there's an arousal phase where there's significant physiological changes. Uh, as uh, again, I'm sure most everyone is familiar with, if sexual stimulation is sufficient and sustained during that arousal phase, uh, eventually one will come to orgasm and then following orgasm, what's referred to as a resolution or the return back to the uh, unaroused state. Uh, this next slide here is the uh, culmination of Masters and Johnson research. As I mentioned before, uh, requires a little bit of explanation because they're a bit confusing. You can see on the left there, a diagram for male sexual response and on the right, female sexual response. Uh, not surprisingly, pardon me if, pardon me if I'm uh, being sexist in saying this, but uh, I'm sure I wouldn't get much pushback in saying that men are generally simpler, uh, less complex uh, than women, and our sexuality often follows that pattern. Uh, I wish I would have uh, looked for it and included it in the handout. There's a famous picture that uh, sex therapists love to uh, throw around and include in PowerPoints where it's kind of a split screen and one, one half is a, like the front panel of a, a machine with all kinds of dobs, uh, knobs and dials and levers and switches and uh, then the other half is, uh, that's supposed to be representative of women, the other half is just a box with a switch on or off and that's supposed to represent men. Of course, uh, humor notwithstanding, uh, we are far more similar than we are different. Personally, I'll share with you, I've never been much of a fan of uh, John Gray's Mars and Venus work, um, notably because uh, I don't like the idea of reinforcing uh, this concept that men and women are different species from different planets destined to never understand one another. Uh, I'm sure we all agree that we are far more similar than we are different. Uh, there are obvious physiological differences, but even if one looks um, developmentally, especially um, embryologically, uh, it's just remarkable, and many people are surprised to, to find this, that every part that we have, every sexual organ and structure in one gender, there is a corresponding one in the other gender. In fact, uh, at the very beginning of fetal development, all of those organs start from the same uh, tissue, the same structures. You may or may not be familiar with the idea of differentiation, and uh, usually somewhere between six, seven, eight to ten weeks of fetal development in what's referred to as an undifferentiated state, males and females look identical. Even further into the second trimester, if, if one looks at an ultrasound, uh, you know, parents are often eager to try and uh, uh, get a guess of the sex of their uh, uh, child. And if the baby's in the right position at the right time, sometimes they can get a glimpse. But if you look at a little fetal crotch, uh, what often looks like a small penis may uh, be a clitoris and both penises and clitorises derived from the same embryological tissue, uh, as I said, including every other structure. There will be a corresponding or analogous part. Nevertheless, Masters and Johnson studied thousands of, of uh, test subjects willing to actually have intercourse in laboratory conditions under fluorescent lights with science geeks with lab coats observing and all kinds of measuring and monitoring devices. They actually developed a, uh, uh, a, a long glass phallic shaped uh, uh, object with a camera inside that, that saw for the first time changes uh, in the vagina during uh, female sexual arousal and really truly remarkable stuff. So let me try to explain as quick as I can what they found. You can see time on the horizontal axes and level of arousal on the vertical. And looking at the male diagram first, you see this excitement phase. Now you may notice that uh, uh, compared to the first slide I showed you, Masters and Johnson kind of missed. I don't know if they forgot about it or didn't find it important enough, but they missed the concept of desire, which as we'll see in later slides, is the uh, can be thought of as the locomotive that drives this train. 
uh, another sex therapist pioneer uh, from New York in the 70s and 80s was a woman named Helen Singer Kaplan, who uh, contributed that piece to what she felt was missing from the Masters and Johnson model. So they started with the, you know, the unaroused state and then this excitement phase where you can see sexual arousal increases significantly and fairly rapidly and then leveling out to a plateau phase where while there isn't increased arousal, there is uh, sustained arousal. And of course, time is variable from, for many, many factors from person to person, uh, from the same person from time to time Aging, uh, of course, has a, a, an effect on uh, usually increasing the time for all of these processes. Nevertheless, again, if arousal is uh, sufficient and sustained, there's that classic over the hump part there of uh, orgasm and a resolution where the person returns down to uh, back down to baseline to the unaroused state. And you can see the dotted lines there and a bracket indicating what's referred to as a refractory period. And you may notice that that's only in the male diagram. Uh, the refractory period, I guess, uh, uh, to put it most vernacularly, if that's a real word, uh, is the uh, recharge time. Uh, most men cannot uh, orgasm uh, again after one since for I'd say maybe 99 plus percent of men, orgasm and ejaculation, those separate processes occur simultaneously. And once a guy ejaculates, he typically can't ejaculate again until a sufficient refractory period. And as I said, that also is tremendously variable. A horny young guy of 16 might need five or 10 minutes before he's able to uh, go for another go and be able to ejaculate again. Uh, an older guy in his 60s or 70s may need 12, 18, even 24 hours before he's able to uh, ejaculate again. And if you look at the female diagram, I guess the easiest part of that complexity uh, is the um, the uh, lack of a refractory period, which means that women can be multi-orgasmic, that a woman can have an orgasm and then another orgasm and really as many as she wants uh, before that resolution. But you can see three different lines there, the A, B, and the C lines, which requires a bit of explanation. Uh, the black line labeled A appears identical to what we see in the left diagram, a male response, a nice steady uh, excitement, excitation phase, a plateau, and then an orgasm, a second orgasm with the dotted line, and then the resolution. Uh, the sort of fuchsia-colored pink line there, uh, let's say that's representing woman B, shows uh, a steady uh, arousal and a kind of a wavy line there. You see no orgasm and resolution. And I often like to ask uh, folks if they think that if that was the response graph of a particular woman's sexual response, do you think she enjoyed that or not? And many people often say no, because she didn't have an orgasm and all that sexual tension wasn't dissipated. And just as many people say yes, because it seems like you know maybe she just enjoyed being in a state of heightened sexual arousal for a while. And even if she didn't have an orgasm, may, um, just as well be uh, satisfied and content. Uh, woman C, that kind of light purplish, bluish line uh, is a little unusual. You see the arousal is a bit herky-jerky. It goes up and drops down, goes up and drops down. And then you can see it just kind of zooms right to orgasm without any uh, plateau phase. I've always interpreted that as uh, maybe the possibility of um, Women's, again, pardon the sexist generalizations, but uh, uh, women more than men seem to be more susceptible to distraction or losing the moment, or maybe an intrusive thought might pop up and cause that decrease uh, in arousal. And as far as the zooming right to orgasm, I believe that just shows that women are just as capable 
if, uh, if a woman is turned on and aroused and uh, aroused and receptive, uh, as capable of reaching orgasm as quickly as men, which kind of flies in the face of the typical uh, stereotype that most of us grow up with, that men are uh, ready at a moment's notice, just always uh, ready to go. And women need all of this revving and priming and warming up. Uh, even the word uh, foreplay, which I dislike and tend not to use, uh, implies that there's some play that's required before, quote, the main event, or what most people assume the main event of sex is, is intercourse, which of course is just one of hundreds of ways that people can sexually pleasure one another. Uh, another friend and colleague and giant in the field, uh, Marty Klein from Northern California, has said before that uh, um, intercourse uh, is the, uh, well, uh, yeah, intercourse is the only sexual activity that requires an erection. And that usually makes people go, hmm, but isn't that what sex is? And he's making the point that sex is everything from kissing and touching and caressing and everything else. Uh, there's a wonderful made-up word. I don't know who to credit for making up the word, but it, it uh, I believe, does a better job than foreplay. And that word is outer course, just describing that that it's all, it's all sex play. Very often, when a couple uh, does come to see me uh, for sex therapy, one of the first things uh, I instruct them to do is is say, from now on, we are cutting the goals off the uh, we're cutting the end zones off the field. There's no moving the ball down the goal, to use a football or a soccer analogy, but, but more like the floor exercises in gymnastics. We're just going to play on the field and run all around the field and not worry about a goal orientation. In fact, most, th most sex therapy treatment does begin with uh, removing any uh, demand performance-oriented, goal-oriented activities and just focuses on um, this phrase, mutual non-demand pleasuring, where a lot of touch and, and a lot of sensual massage, and I'll talk about it later, I think that's where a lot of the um, not so great reputation comes from, uh, from people trying to assign sensate focus dates to couples without really explaining the rationale behind why, uh, without acknowledging, I always tell couples I know that what I'm asking you to do may feel uh, a little awkward or unnatural or take some getting used to because let's be honest most couples are pretty focused on intercourse when sexual activity begins and to take that off the table and kind of push them into this creative space of finding new ways uh, to pleasure one another I often tell couples that that sex therapy is a process of uh, learning more about their own and each other's sexuality together. And uh, it's very exciting kind of therapy. Uh, very often it's the kind of therapy that uh, uh, takes on a life of its own and just goes and we get to just kind of sit back and watch it and, and uh, offer suggestions. Just generally speaking, not to sex therapy, but to therapy uh, across the board, I also find it important to tell patients, uh, clients, that coming to see me once a week or every other week whenever we do meet is not really what being in therapy is about. I'm sure you, you, you know you, many of you have had clients that don't really do much uh, in between sessions. And so I encourage them to think about, you know, once this process has started, this hour a week that we're talking is not really therapy. It's the other 167 hours a week that you're in therapy, where you're trying to notice things, notice patterns, kind of bust yourself, recognizing, oh, there's that thing again. Let me do something differently. Let me, uh, um, you know, uh, not react so uh, uh, reflexively, not repeat the same old patterns. Uh, and then the hour that we're in the office together, we can talk about how the therapy is going and maybe tweak some things, maybe make some suggestions and uh, um, help couples through, or individuals, of course, help them through the issues uh, that they've brought to us. So uh, let me, OK. 
okay. Uh, before I talk more generally about sex therapy, just another couple of models of sexual response. Um, first, you can see uh, shortly after Masters and Johnson's work, this is a very simplified version of Helen Kaplan's contribution, just adding that desire component to the arousal and orgasm and resolution. Earlier models basically just pointed to things like muscle tension, uh, or myotonia and increased blood flow and blood pressure and then just the reversal of all of that. So you can see how things got a bit more specific. Uh, then in 2001, uh, Rosemary Basson from, uh, I believe, University of Toronto, if memory serves correct, um, she presented this, what she calls, as you can see on the slide, a nonlinear model of female sexual response. I've actually discussed this with uh, Dr. Besson and told her that uh, uh, I couldn't help but find this to be a bit sexist. I, I had wished she would not have included the word female in there, but just rather a nonlinear model, because that was the complaint that Masters and Johnson is linear, that, what, that people go from A to B to C to D, and then they're done. And Besson's point is that um, many people don't respond sexually that way. And in her research, she was talking about women as being less linear and more, you can see this kind of circular uh, model for response being a circle. One could start pretty much anywhere, but the main points here uh, are that uh, a woman can start kind of sexually neutral, not necessarily in the mood or feeling horny, and that desire can actually follow arousal. In other words, typically we think of um, spontaneous desire, like one might turn to their partner and say, hey, I'm feeling horny, you feel like fooling around. And this model reminds us that uh, even when one does not necessarily feel uh, a sense of horniness or a desire to have sex, uh, if they are willing, to use an expression from the sex columnist Dan Savage, uh, if they're being GGG, good, giving, and game, uh, they may uh, agree to sexual activity if their partner is, is attempting to initiate, even if they're not necessarily feeling it so much. And then once the kissing and touching and caressing starts, the arousal increases, then the desire comes in, and what we refer to as responsive rather than spontaneous desire. Because the problem with a lot of desire, uh, um, uh, well, primarily hypoactive or, or low desire problems that present, or a couple comes in because they're in conflict because one is wanting sex more often than the other, is the low desire partner might say, you know, I promise, honey, as soon as I feel horny, you'll be the first to know, I'll come running. And if they don't feel horny very often, you know, the days, weeks, months, even years go by and they say, sorry, not feeling it. I'll let you know as soon as I do. This reminds us that uh, it isn't always necessary to have that spontaneous desire. And I have found that there are a great number of men who fit this model much more uh, uh, appropriately than the Masters and Johnson linear A, B, C, D. So I use both. And then there's a third model that I included in here. And still, I, I know both of these authors. Beverly Whipple is, is uh, famous for uh, literally writing the book on the G-spot in 1985. Beverly Whipple and a physical therapist named uh, John Perry wrote that book. And it continues to be controversial in terms of uh, an element of female sexual response. Uh, there continues to be debate about whether or not there is such a thing as a G-spot. Uh, we certainly know that anatomically there is no structure. If one were to dissect the vagina from a female cadaver, uh, one would see that it's basically a sleeve. And if you cut open that sleeve and have kind of a triangle of tissue, there is no way to say, oh, there's a bump right there, there's the G-spot, and you don't see it on an anatomical diagram. Uh, however, 
of course, ask a woman who has uh, so-called G-spot orgasms uh, if there's such a thing. And, you know, you'll get some funny looks. And there does seem to be something that's going on when stimulation or pressure is applied. Uh, uh, most often, the gesture described is that uh, come hither motion, that if one pushes up and in to the sort of roof of the vagina, uh, there's an area that has this reputation of triggering powerful orgasms, possibly multiple orgasms, or a phenomenon uh, uh, sometimes referred to as squirting, where fluid is expelled from the vagina during orgasm or, or female ejaculation, although that's also a bit of a misnomer because it's a very, very different uh, process than what we think of as uh, ejaculation of semen in men. Karen Brash McGreer uh, was Beverly's partner in putting this together. And if you notice the date, it actually preceded Rosemary Basson's model by about four years. And I've spoken to both of them and, and nobody seems to know why this model did not really get much traction or uh, uh, have the impact that Rosemary Basson's did. But this is actually my favorite because if you look at this diagram, you can kind of see uh, everybody there. You see the, the middle, Masters and Johnson, the excitement, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. You see Kaplan's contribution by putting desire at the front. And you see this circular uh, aspect to all of these phases where desire is associated with seduction. And we know this to be true, you know, if someone is uh, uh, trying to make time with someone, uh, very often they bring gifts, flowers or chocolate or, or uh, a date. Even in the animal kingdom, you often see a tomcat will bring a dead bird to a female as a gesture. Hey, you know, I brought you something. Are, are, you, uh, are you interested? Um, that can be problematic when we look at some se sexual scripts and see particularly those for men that uh, sound disturbingly transactional. In other words, that sense that sex is bought in one form or another, uh, whether it's literally paying a sex worker cash for sex or this idea that, hey, I took you out and I spent a lot of money. I dropped 150 bucks on dinner and 200 bucks on theater tickets. You owe me something now. That's incredibly problematic um, for uh, obvious reasons I don't believe I need to even get into. During the excitement and plateau phases, you see the corresponding notion of sensations. And that's also something that very often people uh, kind of forget about when they're so focused on genital activities and, and a rush to intercourse and orgasm. Uh, a dear friend and colleague uh, recently said that she believes that people aren't really uh, making love to one another anymore. They're just really getting off together. And uh, again, going through rote uh, activities in a rush to get to intercourse and uh, orgasm instead of uh, really taking the time to focus on sensations all over the body, the breathing, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the increased sensitivity. Let's not forget that uh, uh, the primary sex organ of our bodies is not between our legs, but between our ears. And the largest sex organ of our body is our skin, which remember is one contiguous organ, including the part of our skin that, that covers our genitals. So uh, during sexual response, our entire skin is much more uh, sensate, uh, in addition to just uh, obvious sensations in, in the uh, groin. During the orgasm phase, uh, Whipple and Brash McGuire have added, I think, a very, very key element of surrender. And uh, I can talk about this a little bit later when we are assessing, uh, particularly in women, the inability to have orgasm, what's typically, uh, or, or I should say, clinically referred to as anorgasmia, the uh, inability to have an orgasm. Although several researchers, most notably uh, Ellen Lahn from Amsterdam and um, uh, author named Natalie Angier has written extensively about this. Um, 
they prefer to use a term like pre-orgasmic, saying that a woman just has not had an orgasm yet, not that she necessarily can't, that unless there's some medical or, or uh, organic reason, uh, both of those have likened it to the idea of riding a bicycle, where it's kind of a body learning, and once we learn it, it's there forever. And I'm sure most of us recall from childhood learning how to ride a bike, uh, how scary the sensations may be until there's that moment where our body just kind of gets it. Then we can feel comfortable with the balance. We're not so scared anymore. We could take off the training wheels and we can go 30 years without riding a bicycle. We pick one up and we will not have forgotten how to ride. Uh, it's similar to that idea of a body learning and the idea of surrender is critical, especially for women because of that letting go that seems to be required uh, for orgasm to happen. If a woman is, is worried, if she's in her head, there's another, uh, I believe, made up word that sex therapists love to use called spectatoring, uh, which often leads to a very common thing called performance anxiety, where one is so intent on watching their performance uh, judging themselves. Are they doing it right? Is it good enough? Is it uh, uh, lasting long enough? Men are notorious for worrying about their erections. And uh, I often tell guys who worry about erectile dysfunction that the most guaranteed way to lose an erection is worrying about losing an erection. Uh, there's a lot involved there with the nervous system. Most of us tend to not realize that sexual arousal is actually a relaxation phenomenon because we tend to feel so excited. But if you recall our uh, uh, autonomic nervous system with its sympathetic and parasympathetic branches, the adrenergic or fight or flight versus the cholinergic side, it's actually that parasympathetic branch that we need firing to become aroused, to get an erection, to uh, become uh, uh, engorged and, and uh, uh, wet. And then it kind of flips to the sympathetic side, the adrenaline side during uh, orgasm. Uh, I've often compared this surrender to, uh, in women that have difficulty achieving orgasm to similar difficulties that many children have when it's also, I believe, kind of a body learning thing. Uh, when we are young and experiencing uh, falling asleep even notice how unusual it is that we use the verb falling when we talk about sleep, right? That, that in itself implies a kind of a scary little letting go. We can't force ourselves to sleep. I can't get into bed and say, oh, I have a really busy day tomorrow. I need a good night's sleep. <clears throat> and right, we have to let go and allow sleep to kind of uh, uh, overtake us. And I believe that's very similar to uh, orgasm, especially in women. And then I love how they've added the uh, concept of reflection during the resolution. Uh, I don't, it's not a uniquely human thing. There's fascinating, fascinating research if anyone is interested on bonobo chimps, our closest genetic relatives. Uh, and for all of time that we thought, you know, humans were different than uh, animals, uh, bonobos disprove that and have sex for a lot of the same reasons uh, that humans do and also do bond and connect and have this period of reflection uh, after sex, whereas most, uh, most other in the animal kingdom uh, tend to, you know, have sex and move along, disappear, particularly if you've ever seen uh, big cats lions and tigers, you know, lions, the alpha male, the king of the pride, can lay around and sleep 12, 14 hours a day or longer and just have no worries at all, except that you'll notice if you've ever seen like uh, Nature Channel shows, uh, when it's time for intercourse, it's very, very quick and the male is hypervigilant because they can't be caught, you know, they can't just completely surrender to sex the way we encourage people to uh, because, you know, they can't be snuck up on. So uh, intercourse happens very quickly uh, and then he might go back to sleep. Uh, but reflection is key. 
uh, and you may have heard about some of the other chemicals. We don't have really a lot of time in today's presentation to go through all of the um, endopharmacology, the endogenous chemistry that's going on and mediating all of these uh, processes. One uh, commonly associated with orgasm is the uh, hormone oxytocin, which is uh, often described as a bonding hormone, which gives us that warm, fuzzy, lovey-dovey, connected feeling uh, that's associated with uh, uh, the afterglow of intercourse for many people. So moving on uh, with those basic uh, concepts of uh, sexual response and what our bodies do, we can see from the next couple slides that of course there's a lot of factors that do influence sexual response in people. Um, from physiological things like cardiovascular health, neurological health, and uh, endocrine health. Uh, sometimes, like I'll, I'll say for example, uh, erectile dysfunction, if you have a guy presenting who's say 68 years old, um, overweight, pre-diabetic, hypertensive, uh, and a big gut in front of him, uh, chances are uh, you can probably safely bet that he's got erectile dysfunction. It's kind of a perfect storm because erections require good blood flow, uh, good neurological function, and good hormone balance. Uh, and, um, you know, sometimes uh, we call these cases organic or physiological, although I will make a point later on that, that part of our more modern approach to sex therapy is the realization that there is really no such thing, as we used to say, as the purely medical uh, uh, sexual dysfunction. In other words, if a guy, like I just described, presents to us, in the past would present to a sex therapist, the sex therapist would say, well, the first thing I have to do is send you to a physician to quote, rule out organicity. And if it's determined that your erectile dysfunction is the result of physical issues, then, you know, that's not our wheelhouse. That's a medical issue that's to be treated medically. Now, of course, we realize that even if it is entirely physiological, that's not gonna make a guy feel much better about the fact that he can't uh, get or keep erections. And there's always a psychological component, which is why you'll see as I go through the PowerPoint today, I'm a, a rather vocal advocate for the idea of integrating sexual medicine with sex therapy. Uh, and one of my fantasies is that someday there'll be a sex therapist in every urologist's office, gynecologist's office, endocrinologist. And as we'll see later, it doesn't stop with just penis and vagina doctors. It goes really across the board in recognizing that sexuality is truly a quality of life issue. So we also see more psychological and attitudinal factors, uh, sexy thoughts, uh, relationship satisfaction and contentment, and of course, attitude. Moving along, some of the medical factors causing sexual dysfunction, I'm sure these are super obvious to everyone. Uh, whether they're the uh, sequelae of surgery or uh, chemotherapy or radiation treatment for cancer or uh, organic depression or the side effects of medication, many times these can cause uh, sexual problems, if not full-blown dysfunction. However, I just I will make a sidebar point here. Uh, I'm sure many of us have heard of particular drugs that are notorious for sexual side effects. Most uh, familiar to us as mental health professionals would be antidepressants, especially the SSRIs, uh, starting with Prozac and now the dozens of basic variations uh, of that theme of blocking the reuptake of serotonin, which I do have to say is kind of a leap of faith and not really very good science to say that it seems like if we're keeping serotonin active uh, longer, that mood improves, that we just kind of jump to that conclusion and say, aha, therefore, depression must be caused by uh, a lack of serotonin. And it's far more complicated than that. But 
some of the many of these SSRIs are, as I said, notorious for causing sexual side effects, most commonly uh, delayed uh, orgasm uh, or um, sometimes even inhibited orgasm in both men and women. Uh, not so likely to cause erectile dysfunction in men, although sometimes uh, that's often talked about. And we also have to consider which is causing the dysfunction. Is it the uh, antidepressant or is it the, the depression? Depression itself can cause uh, sexual dysfunction. But the, the point I wanted to make is um, even if a drug doesn't have quote unquote sexual side effects, uh, but the list of side effects for a particular drug are uh, nausea and vomiting and headache and diarrhea. Uh, who's going to feel very sexy with those kinds of uh, uh, symptoms? So, uh, you know, sometimes we have to deal uh, with side effects. We have to uh, be creative and help folks adapt. Uh, especially if, like so many men, uh, there's this idea that sex equals intercourse and intercourse requires an erection. And many guys believe that erections are mandatory equipment that we have to show up with for sex to happen instead of realizing that erections are a result of sexual arousal and response. And, and the uh, classic formula for erections, for orgasm for men and women is friction and fantasy both right and again that may also change uh, as we age that uh, horny 16 year old might uh, you know a good stiff breeze might be the only uh, friction they need and the fantasy machine seems to be cranking all the time as we age we may need uh, increasing friction and uh, uh, work harder at kind of logging on to uh, sexy thoughts Okay, and the first slide here on uh, assessment, we see psychosocial issues in sex therapy assessment. Uh, this is, uh, of course, you're all familiar with DSM criteria. Each of the dysfunctions has to be specified whether or not they were lifelong. Have you always had this problem? Have you never been able to uh, um, achieve uh, an orgasm, for example? Or was it acquired? Was it recently? Did it start, you know, maybe six months ago when you lost your job or after your divorce or something like that? Is it generalized in every situation uh, the problem occurs or is it situational? And this is also something that we see commonly. I know uh, uh, it's kind of a goof joke, bear with me, but you know, if a guy says to a therapist, I don't understand, every time I try and have intercourse with my wife, I lose my erection. Uh, and it never happens with my secretary, right? One certainly doesn't need to be uh, Sherlock Holmes to figure out what's going on in this situation uh, where, you know, he may be guilty that he's cheating and maybe his penis is more, uh, more honest than his brain. Uh, but those qualifiers are across the board for all of the, uh, the diagnoses uh, in that section of DSM. But there are also a lot of sociocultural messages that we grow up with about sex, whether it's good girls and bad girls or bad boys or, or what sex is supposed to be, uh, who it's for. I know it's the 21st century, but there are still a lot of women who grow up with this message that sex is for men and something that they um, are obliged Right. I often tell couples who start sex therapy that, you know, at the end of the first session, from this point forward, from now on, uh, this answer to the question, do you want to have sex? <sighs> Fine. That's not, that's not a yes anymore. That's a no. Unless it's an enthusiastic yes, as much, yeah, as much as you do, then that's, we're going to, we're going to count that as a no. There's no more. <sighs> All right. Get it over with. Right. That is not consent in my book. And of course, we know how prevalent body image issues are. Even supermodels have uh, uh, body image issues and none of us can compete with them. So uh, the media and pop culture and entertainment often uh, deliver messages about sexiness and sex appeal uh, that can really do some heavy damage 
to one's uh, sense of themselves and, and part very often part of that spectatoring that I mentioned before is folks lying in bed even during sexual activity worrying about what does my body look like in this light? Is it too bright in here? Is, if, I'm in, if, if I'm in this position, does this part shift or that part? You know, these are all very unsexy thoughts that keep us out of this immersive experience that good sex is supposed to be. Of course, we'd want to ask about a psychiatric history and stress and anxiety. And as I mentioned before, partner sexual dysfunction is very critical. If a guy shows up by himself uh, and goes to a sex therapy, and many guys do start by themselves because they're embarrassed or they want to feel out the therapist or they feel like this is their problem to get over and they don't want to trouble their partner with it, uh, I almost always suggest or at least try uh, to get the partner involved because most uh, sex therapy uh, is more successful when folks, when, when it's a partner, when it's considered a couple's issue and both folks work on it together. But if a guy shows up by himself complaining about uh, erectile dysfunction and the right questions aren't asked and the clinician does not learn that, uh, let's say, the guy's with a, a female partner, uh, uh, that she is experiencing sexual pain, that, in fact, is, I think, a pretty good sign. I think that's a, that's a sign of a good guy uh, who feels bad and doesn't want to hurt his partner, so he loses his erection. Uh, because there's unfortunately way too many guys who just don't seem to care, who feel that sex is their, uh, their right, their, uh, they feel entitled to sex, and uh, if they're buying into that old message that it's not for women anyway, then, you know, so it hurts a little bit. So, you know, maybe uh, she'll have a glass of wine and, and uh, it won't be so bad. Uh, a researcher, a colleague named Debbie Herbenick, uh, past president of ASECT, she's at the University of Indiana, uh, completed a study last year that I, it was one, one of their findings I found stunning. They found I think 30 or 31 percent of women reported either experiencing pain or expecting that pain will be part of sex, which just makes me want to pull my hair out. That sex is never supposed to be painful and no one should ever expect Oh, well, I guess that's, you know, that's part of the deal. Uh, so we need to be able to assess not just the problem walking in the door, but uh, if there's a uh, relationship, the, uh, the relationship status, what's going on. And, and a very powerful question to ask is, tell me about your most recent sexual experience or your most recent intimacy. Uh, it's much more effective than just saying, uh, you know, I think the way therapists are often trained uh, uh, generally is this idea, you know, you remember this from uh, grad school, we need to first kind of build some rapport, some connection with the patient, and then create this therapeutic alliance, and maybe spend two or three, maybe even four sessions getting all of this backstory and then finally, you know, almost like you can hear the drum roll building by the fourth or fifth session, the therapist is awkwardly, uncomfortably saying, uh, so how's, uh, you know, how's the old sex life? You can almost see, see them saying, please say fine, please say fine. And the couple says, fine. They say, great, terrific, glad to hear it. Let's go back to talking about your communication, where to me, I have no idea what fine means. I mean, usually I guess it's positive, but fine is also, we know, one of those um, uh, discussion stoppers or an avoidance kind of thing. You know, you run into an old friend on the street, you say, hey, hey how you doing? They say, fine, thank you, how are you? That's the expected response. Nobody really wants the answer to that question. Right? You see a friend say, hey, how are you? You say, well, I've been having problems here and I've got this gas and my stuff. It's like, whoa, whoa, I don't care. I don't really want you to tell me how you are. It's a social grace. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you, how are you? So when I hear fine, okay, I'm going to assume uh, that that's positive, but I need to know more. So I say, fine, okay, good. Fine is good, but uh, you know, can you be more specific? Like when was the most recent sexual experience you two shared? 
and they might look at each other and go, what's it been about nine, 10 months? So then we say, okay, now let's talk about what fine really means, right? So uh, it's, uh, like I said at the beginning, it really is about uh, asking the questions. And with that being said, I'm gonna see if there are any questions. I don't see any typed, but uh, if, like I said before, don't be shy. Just uh, let me know if you need any clarification on anything that I'm saying. Okay, and of course these pictures speak thousands of words. There are just infinite relationship problems. Like I said before, a lot of uh, a lot of times what presents as sexual problems uh, is really just sex taking the hit for a relationship problem. So uh, I say this as a reminder to our sex therapy uh, students that of course we have to be uh, psychotherapists before we can be sex therapists. And um, oddly enough, this might sound strange to some of you, but we really should be couples therapists as well. And um, I say that because it might seem like a no brainer to most of you that, that sex therapy often involves couples. But there are a lot of people that can go through all of the training and requirements to get licensed and be a psychotherapist and train as a sex therapist and not really have a lot of couples work. And they really work uh, with individuals uh, or kind of two individuals at once under the guise of couples therapy. So, um, for example, ASECT has updated their requirements to be certified as a sex therapist uh, to have at least 16 hours in couples therapy uh, because sex very often uh, happens in the context of a relationship and it can be defining of that relationship. It's been referred to as kind of the glue that holds people together. Uh, many of you may be familiar with another noted sex therapist and author named Barry McCarthy, uh, who's written a number of great books. And though I don't quite exactly get the math and the point he's making, I get the general point. Dr. McCarthy says that uh, uh, good sex in a relationship can improve the quality of that relationship by a factor of 15%, but bad sex can cause deficit uh, by a factor of 50%. So again, not quite sure what the math is, but the point is clear that bad sex can have a much more damaging effect on a relationship, whereas good sex can really improve it. And of course, there's that old uh, uh, nugget from the hippies back in the late 60s, early 70s, who often said that good sex will get you through times with no money better than money will get you through times with no sex. And having my practice in Boca Raton, some, certainly not all, but some of my clients would be what we'd consider affluent. And folks can have tons and tons of money and still uh, really be suffering with their sex life. Uh, and conversely, a couple that's really in love and really having a great time could live in a cardboard box on the sidewalk and have a great sex life. So now our overview of sex therapy, you can see from this slide, next couple slides are really a big overview, but it is a biopsychosocial modality. It is talk therapy. I'm sure you all know this, but a lot of the lay public still has a lot of odd misconceptions about what sex therapy is. Some people have asked if, uh, if we're gonna watch them have sex, if we have beds in our office, or if we follow them home and stand at the foot of the bed, imagine that, you know, Mr. Jones, get up. I'm only gonna show you this one more time. and Climb in the bed with Mrs. Jones. There is no nudity, no touch, no sexual activity. It's just a form of talk therapy, but the content is primarily of a sexual nature. And of course, sex therapy does look at multi-dimensional aspects. Uh, including the individual, uh, individual, the relational, the psychosocial, and the biological. Uh, my late mentor, uh, Dr. Susan Lee, uh, who I, she was my supervisor for almost 15 years and, and gave me my career, and uh, I miss her every day. She was trained by Helen Singer Kaplan, and that, that 
old cohort of sex therapists in New York in the 80s, excuse me. <coughs> and she would quote uh, uh, Dr. Kaplan as describing sex therapy as a cognitive behavioral therapy with a psychodynamic underpinning. And for me, my interpretation of that anyway, is kind of turning around what I described before as that process of building this rapport, learning all about the individual or couple, getting all this backstory and building up to the sex life or the sexual problem, and instead kind of addressing the problem that walks in the door. What brought you here? What prompted your call? In fact, I'm one of those therapists. I don't even get into very much on the phone. When someone calls to schedule an appointment, I don't really care why. I mean, I'm assuming there's a reason they found me. Uh, my Psychology Today profile uh, emphasizes primarily sex therapy. So I assume there's a reason they called. So I say, when would you like to come in? We schedule, and then they come in and I say, what prompted your call? But uh, uh, how can I help you? And uh, yeah, sometimes we are aware quickly. Sometimes it takes us a little while to see that that psychodynamic underpinning, the kind of um, history or the baggage that they've brought into the relationship is affecting the present. But my personal druthers is to stay as much as possible in the here and now, in the present the presenting problem, the history of the presenting problem, uh, and what kind of interventions we might suggest. But keep this in mind, another powerful question uh, after asking, you know, when was the most recent, uh, and, and being specific about when was the most recent versus tell me about your sex life is important because people tend to give kind of you know, appropriate global answers or answers that we think uh, uh, they think we want to hear. So it's a specific question, not just how's your sex life, uh, but when was the most recent? And if they say, oh, it was a, a week ago, I might say, and tell me about it. What were you doing? Who initiated? What were you doing before? Uh, you know, how did it go? Uh, you know, was there a lot of foreplay or you know, whatever details, Susan used to say exquisite details, uh, uh, and that therein lies uh, our best um, assessment information. Uh, but the, uh, the, the next really wonderful question, even in the most contentious, angry couples, I've had couples, I'm sure many of you have too, where if they were any further apart on the couch, they'd break the arms off. But Here's one of these magical questions. Tell me what it was like when you first, when you two first got together. Now, this is certainly not everybody, but most couples, from my experience, when they hear that question, get that kind of, you know, you can almost see it wash over their face. They get this kind of, uh, well, you know, it was hot. It was great. We couldn't keep our hands off each other. We had sex all the time in every room in the house. And that, not to suggest that we can turn back time, of course, but if we can connect to that, to get them thinking about those feelings, the affection they had for each other before, you know, life's usual suspects got in the way. And it's almost always the same things, kids, families, in-laws, money, stress, work, division of labor, all of the usual things that um, kind of kill well, of course, we know the honeymoon has to end in every relationship by definition, uh, and it kind of kills the erotic sometimes. I've noticed I, uh, if I had to pin it down to one uh, theory, I'd say the natural entropy or the natural slide that most relationships follow is this hot and sexy honeymoon phase which then uh, moves into a uh, kind of a routine phase where sex becomes a little predictable, a little bit the same thing all the time, not as uh, new and exciting as at the beginning. But left to its own devices and with all of these stressors uh, uh, contributing, then routine sex often becomes uh, obligatory sex. Right? Like, hey, baby, it's Saturday night. You know what that means? 
and that's where you tend to get these okay right and then if that continues long enough obligatory sex tends to move into perfunctory sex and perfunctory sex is that kind of all right fine just get it over with i gotta get to sleep or or uh, you know sex for the sake of having sex where like i said before quoting a, a colleague people are really just getting off together they're thinking about their own orgasm they're hardly even noticing their partner's pleasure which of course i'm sure most people would admit that their partner's pleasure is a tremendous turn on for them but if they're in their head focusing on just getting off and getting to sleep then you know we're not, we're not talking about a good ideal and from perfunctory sex uh, it's only a matter of time before resentment starts coming in. And of course, we don't want anybody feeling resentful at being asked to have sex. I've had a couple of women I can recall in my practice who've used the same word, saying that sex is like taking out the garbage, like a chore. And if I never had to do it again, I wouldn't miss it. Clearly, these are people uh, having sex for the wrong reasons. And from my experience, not really understanding their own sexuality. Uh, a lot of people are surprised to hear, for example, uh, a little sexual trivia for you, that um, it's only about 25 or 30 percent of women who report uh, easily and regularly achieving orgasm through vaginal inter intercourse from uh, penile vaginal penetration alone. Right? That's a small percentage, a quarter or a third, and I'm certainly not about to say that 70 or 75 percent of women are dysfunctional. I would just say that intercourse is not the most efficient way for a woman to achieve an orgasm. It really is all about the clitoris, and most people I find shocking as this is to me, uh, it never stops being shocking how few people, men sure, but women, women do not know about their clitoris. They don't know the uh, full anatomy of their clitoris. Most of us tend to think of it as, you know, the little man in the boat, a little button there, or even just a dot and a line shown on external uh, anatomy diagrams, and don't realize that, again, as I said before, uh, uh, developmentally, the clitoris and the penis are uh, grow from identical tissue. Uh, they look exactly the same in cross-section, except, of course, the clitoris doesn't have a urethra running through it the way a man's penis does, uh, but they're just the, the same three tubes of spongy uh, erectile tissue that become engorged and filled with blood. But that visible or maybe not so visible part, because when a woman's aroused, the clitoris pulls up instead of, you know, the penis gets erect and stands up and out from the body, when the clitoris gets erect, it tends to pull up and under the clitoral hood. But that part of it, there's the glands like the penis, a head and a shaft. But the shaft goes up and bends back. And the majority, the vast majority, the iceberg part of the clitoris is internal. And it, the shaft goes up and bends back, goes down and splits into two legs, which both have huge bulbs of spongy erectile tissue, which literally straddle the urethra and the vagina. So chances are, when women do have an orgasm from intercourse, it's because of stimulation of the internal parts, the legs, if you will, of uh, the clitoris. I'll tell you, my brother and I were at a sex therapy conference in Denver last year, and he won a raffle, a big, like, nine-inch tall, uh, 3D-printed plastic clitoris. And it was a wonderful conversation starter at the hotel bar, I can tell you that. But not a single person, not a man, not a woman, no one could identify it. One woman said, is that a, a, a coat hanger or something to hang your robe on? Uh, because it's, you know, it's large, it has these legs, it has these bulbs. Uh, and if you don't know, that's your homework for today to uh, Google the uh, anatomy of the clitoris, and that is critical for uh, orgasm. We know some of you might have dealt with uh, cultural issues, working with patients from uh, some Muslim or African countries where um, what we refer to as FGM, or female genital mutilation, is still practiced as part of their 
uh, values and cultural beliefs. Uh, and most Westerners are horrified at the thought of removing the clitoral hood surgically, or even the visible portion of the clitoris, or even removing the visible portion of the clitoris and the clitoral hood and sewing up a tiny bit of the top of the vagina. We would, most people are horrified by that, but, um, you know, I've stepped in it once. I insulted a woman from Sudan uh, just with my face, and she's, she was like startled at my horrified expression and said, no, you, you think I'm complaining about this. I, I am glad this was done, and I want this done to my daughter. I had to get over my own stuff, put it aside, and uh, recognize that this was her value. However, uh, that being said, there was a uh, historical precedent set during the Clinton administration when a woman for the first time was granted asylum uh, for fleeing her uh, home country um, for her desire not to have this done to her or her daughter. And the Clinton administration did grant that, uh, that <laughs> asylum. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's move on. You can see this slide here again, a lot of integration, sex therapy. Uh, I like to think again, my bias notwithstanding, that sex therapists are among the most cross-trained because uh, we really need to have a good uh, uh, toolbox at our disposal. Some of you may remember back in the late 80s, early 90s, when the term eclectic uh, was much more in vogue, and eclecticism is a very double-edged sword. It can mean that a therapist is very broadly trained, cross-trained, like I said, or unfortunately too often it meant, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. Therapists would say, I dabble. I do a little of this, a little of that. I went to a workshop on this, so I'm, I'm eclectic. But sex therapists really do need an eclectic uh, approach. As you can see from this slide, sometimes it's CBT. Sometimes we have to go deeper into more psychoanalytic approaches. Um, the wonderful thing is, like the old expression, all roads lead to Rome, uh, folks can get to sex therapy from all different kinds of theoretical orientations. You can see there's a lot on systemic approaches. In fact, uh, there's a wonderful textbook called Systemic Sex Therapy by um, Gerald Weeks from the University of Nevada and Nancy Gambeski from Philadelphia. Um, although there's a couple of issues there as well. They, they do, in my opinion, fail to take a truly systemic approach, especially when it comes to things like uh, so-called sex addiction which we can talk about later. I'm sure some of you have questions about that. I will just tell you at this point that I don't believe uh, in the concept and don't believe that someone can become addicted to sex the way they become addicted to heroin or crack or, or alcohol, uh, but we can certainly talk about that. And uh, the systemic folks have uh, contributed um, beautifully to that work as well. Uh, creativity is something uh, a lot of therapists are not really uh, uh, up on. It actually, from uh, my limited experience, I found that it came more from like um, corporate and uh, military type uh, environments than mental health, but there's certainly uh, a tremendous benefit to be had by bringing uh, creativity principles into mental health. And I happen to believe that sex therapy is a creative process in which we join with an individual or a couple uh, in their uh, their therapy. You know, I had a, a favorite professor in my graduate program that once said, your first thousand cases don't count. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you get the point behind that. And that stays with me in this, uh, in training folks to do sex therapy, because I really want people to, to understand that it doesn't matter if you've done this a thousand times, uh, if you've treated erectile dysfunction a thousand times before. You've never treated it with this couple. So if, if the sex therapist thinks of it as the first time every time, then we are really not doing any kind of cookie cutter therapy and it's always their process 
Uh, another way to think about it is we're the dance instructors, but they're on the floor dancing. We're not dancing with them. And of course, especially nowadays with the rise of sexual medicine, um, sex therapists need to know a great deal about medication and hormones, but that requires a big caveat right there. Uh, we do need to, to remember to stay in our lane. Uh, sometimes, you know, we have listservs, folks post questions about difficult cases and um, too many therapists are quick to ask questions like, well, did you have him uh, sent for, uh, did you have his testosterone checked? And my response is like, uh, okay, uh, Mr. Endocrinologist, what are you gonna do with that data? Right, and what do you know, what if they say yes and they show you a piece of paper with a number on it? Uh, what does that tell you? Can you say, aha, you have low T, that's why you don't have uh, uh, desire? There's guys with high testosterone who have uh, uh, no desire. And is it free testosterone? Is it bound testosterone? Has the serum binding globulin hormone been measured? What time of day was the blood drawn? Men have testosterone peaks and valleys. Typically, there are five testosterone surges during the course of the day. Uh, in fact, this is also very, very diagnostic, asking a guy about morning erections. Uh, the mysterious morning wood, as it's often referred to. Most guys think they wake up with erections because they have to urinate. One has nothing to do with the other. Everybody has to urinate in the morning because that's one of the things that happens while we're sleeping. So our kidneys are filtering our blood and filling our bladder with urine. Sometimes that's what wakes us up, but there's no pressure, there's no nerve that gets pressed by a full bladder that causes an erection. It's just that early morning uh, brings a peak of testosterone. And it doesn't even have to require a sexy dream or sexy thoughts. It's just strictly physiological. Um, I, as I said, sexual medicine is, has been around a long time, but we can certainly safely say that it uh, experienced a, uh, a rebirth in 1998 with the FDA approval of that famous little blue football-shaped pill called Viagra. And I'm sure many of you know that uh, uh, the drug sildenafil is the generic, w was one in a long list of drugs for, who, uh, for which uh, it was really a, a noticed side effect that uh, made the drug what it is. Viagra was not developed as an erectile dysfunction drug. It was being evaluated for uh, angina pectoris, for a cardiac uh, condition. And during clinical trials, apparently there was a lot of old guys that were saying, um, excuse me, haven't noticed this in quite some time. And of course, everybody at Pfizer has been thrilled ever since then. So um, it really marked the first time that urologists had something to tell patients who, especially aging males, who would complain about uh, their erections. And I'm sure most of you remember before ED, before erectile dysfunction, which only sex therapists or medical professionals knew what that meant, and many of them probably thought it meant emergency department, uh, we used to use a more English language word, less clinical word, which is probably the worst thing a male, a fragile male ego would ever want to hear, and I'm sure some of you remember that word being impotence. Uh, if you look up impotent, it means weak useless, ineffectual, uh, everything, you know, again, a, guy, a guy's ego can't stand. So um, when Viagra was approved, uh, now a urologist, instead of saying, well, you know, hey, we all get older, you got to learn to deal with it or, or adapt, now they can go, hey, great, got this new drug, here you go, they write the script, and the guy runs home happy. Except, you know, physicians don't think the way we do. And, and a urologist is not likely going to be thinking about, say, for example, partner issues. Uh, they might not consider that the guy who's thrilled running home, he's, he's so happy, he can't wait to get home. He's running ahead of the car he's driving. And he comes busting in the door and says, hey, honey, guess what? I got Viagra and is completely floored with the reaction of anger because she's like, what? Is I used to just, you know, I used to start un unbutt unbuttoning my blouse and you'd get an erection and chase me around the house. Now I'm standing here in front of you naked, begging you for sex, and 
and nothing. You need pills and what's next? Pulleys and forget it. I don't want to have sex. Go have sex with your pill. Uh, so it's it, it's not in and of itself a magic cure for erectile dysfunction. In fact, this might come as a surprise, but uh, many of the urologists that I work with tell me that as many as half of the Viagra scripts they write are not refilled and um, for a number of reasons. Uh, some of them might really seem stupid, but you know, we can't underestimate <laughs> people's stupidity sometimes. Um, Viagra does nothing centrally, does nothing to the brain. A lot of people think that it's some kind of aphrodisiac that makes guys horny. It's strictly a plumbing thing. It just has to do with opening up channels across cell membranes and increasing blood flow and, and it works locally. And the same thing, remember what I said before, what's required for erection for guys, friction and fantasy. And he needs the same thing with Viagra as he does without Viagra. Instead, what happens is very often guys take the pill and then they start to watch. They watch their watch and they watch their crotch and they go, okay, anytime now. And they just wait like Jack and the Beanstalk throwing beans out in the yard. They just wait for this erection to grow. Uh, what a guy has to do is take the Viagra 45 minutes ahead of time and forget about it. And then just do the same thing as before. I'm sure most of you have seen the commercials for Cialis. Uh, which is really basically the same thing, uh, except that it has a longer uh, duration and a slightly longer uh, onset. In fact, it was odd. When we first started seeing Viagra commercials, people were freaking out. Uh, that, that scary warning at the end that said erections lasting more than four hours should seek immediate medical attention. Well, their owners should seek immediate medical attention. Um, and while some people might want to make jokes about that, like, you know, women might say, oh, erection for four hours, send them over to my place. But uh, if you think about it just for a second, you'd realize why that's so dangerous, because what happens to blood that's not moving? It clots, right? And a guy does not want a penis full of clotted blood. Uh, so that has to be treated immediately. Uh, so guys heard that after Viagra commercials, and then they started hearing Cialis commercials uh, talking about 36 hours and freaked out even more. It certainly doesn't mean that a, the, the drug causes an erection to last for 36 hours. It just means that the drug is on board for 36 hours, that a guy doesn't have to worry about, oh, hurry up, we have to have sex because my pill is going to wear off in a couple of hours. Now he could take the whole weekend, and like they say in the commercial, when the moment is right that the drug is already on board, he doesn't have to think about it, doesn't have to worry about it, but still needs the same old things, friction and fantasy, and the drug uh, uh, can help. Right. Uh, okay. So, quoting Helen Kaplan again, the purpose of sex therapy is uh, um, dealing with sexual disorders and, and the context and, and um, how and why they're problematic. Uh, I started to say before and didn't finish the thought. Uh, sometimes sex therapists can be so behavioral and so focused on what's the intervention to fix this sexual dysfunction. The guy's not getting erections. We know what to do, this and this and this, that we might forget that we also need to take sometimes a more um, existential humanistic approach and think about what that penis is saying, you know, there might be a good reason for a guy's erectile dysfunction. Maybe there's a fear of, uh, or an ambivalence about impregnating his partner. So uh, again, the honesty, quote unquote, uh, is manifested uh, in that way. And the sex therapist might be a little overzealous and have them do sensei focus dates and send them to a urologist for Viagra and voila, the couple's having more frequent intercourse and he's having uh, satisfactory erections. And we ask ourselves, is that a treatment success? Or did we just completely sidestep a whole lot of uh, that, that more psychodynamic underpinning? Um, so again, we're humans first, then we're psychotherapists, then couples therapists, then uh, sex therapists. But we must, uh, one of the other 
initial things we must do is consider the motivation. Uh, one of the first questions asked is, are you committed to staying in this relationship? And if they both are, and we, we trust their sincerity, then we can almost always uh, promise improvements. Maybe not uh, complete restoration, if there's some uh, physiological factors, but adaptation and uh, ultimately satisfaction. And like this last bullet here says, sex should not be the elephant in the room. It should not be uh, avoided uh, by, you know, here's a classic one I've been hearing for years. Um, we have to work on your communication first before we can address your sexual problem. And then I've met some old school MFTs who told me that they used to be fond of saying, if you work on the communication, the sex will take care of itself, as if by magic. And of course, we all know, even they know, that it really doesn't. Uh, people can talk about communication for years and never really get to uh, addressing their sexual problems. In fact, I hate to say this, but uh, a great deal of my clientele are couples that have come to me after unsuccessful uh, treatment with other therapists. And many, many couples have, have told me, they've gone to the therapist saying, we have a sexual problem, can we talk about it? And the therapist, the therapist is the one actively avoiding, saying, yeah, well, no, we have to, first I have to get this backstory, then we have to talk about your communication, then maybe we can talk about the sexual problem. Or we have to treat your depression or your anxiety before we can address your sexual problem. And to me, I think sex is a pretty wonderful antidepressant and a, uh, a great way to help a couple or an individual work through anxiety issues by learning how to relax into arousal and, and redefine sex as something uh, um, positive, life-affirming, and motivating, right? I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone on the call that uh, depression saps motivation. And if one is fortunate enough to be uh, coupled or more, uh, you know, polyamory is becoming more and more trendy. That's, I don't want to get off on a sidebar and waste our time here, but uh, as something that's trending, just like everything else that's trending, uh, it becomes newly defined. So if, a, if you do find a couple or an individual in your practice that identifies as polyamorous, or uh, participating in uh, CNM, consensual non-monogamy, you really need to find out exactly what they mean by that, right? Because there's a lot of things from swinging to partner swapping to uh, threesomes, you know, a lot of things get called polyamory. Uh, there's a fun little word called a polycule, like a molecule, but a polycule where a relationship, instead of a traditional dyad, maybe three or four or five or, or, or more, all equal, very distinct from what uh, you know we know as illegal uh, polygamy, where one person might have multiple spouses or partners. Polyamorous folks are all uh, in it together and, and definitely not for everybody. And certainly, certainly, I can't emphasize strongly enough, not the way to fix a troubled relationship. Just the same way having a kid is a lousy idea uh, to uh, help improve a relationship that's rocky, right? We all know that, that these things are gonna, more often than not, uh, worsen the problems rather than improve them. Uh, this is just, uh, I know it's kind of a confusing slide, but this is from Helen Kaplan, uh, kind of a way of describing Turn-ons and turn-offs, right? I heard someone say it uh, this way, uh, gas and brakes, right? But basically it's looking at the hypothalamic, the, the so-called uh, sex centers of the brain, the limbic system. Uh, we, we know how delicately fine-tuned our endocrine system is with positive and negative feedback loops and turning on and turning off uh, uh, hormone, pituitary hormones and others throughout the body. And you can see to the left, if that's, uh, uh, if one is sexually motivated, you see physical arousal and psychological 
and partner motivators that leads to desire. Otherwise, if there's sexual unmotivation and maybe medical complications, drug side effects, and psychological turnoffs or relationship problems, the result is sexual avoidance. Uh, you'll see in another couple slides uh, a little bit more modern uh, variation on this same theme. So what is the job of the sex therapist? Well, primarily it begins with permission giving. Uh, you'll see on the next slide a, a helpful little uh, mnemonic uh, from the late Jack Annan that goes all the way back to the 1970s known as the Plicit model. So you can see we re resolve conflicts and anxiety, a lot of psychoeducation, another of my favorite made up words where we're teaching folks about their sexual response, about their bodies, and teaching them in a way that would ideally um, move behavior. And as I said before, a lot of uh, homework or, or specific behavioral assignments that are uh, described in exquisite detail in the session, and the couple uh, then goes home and practices uh, uh, in their privacy in their home or in the local Motel 6 or wherever they want to have their uh, sensual dates. Masters and Johnson call them sensate focus, but you know, if you say that, people are going to say, what does that mean? So uh, sensual dates is, is uh, a nicer way to put it. Uh, here's the, oh, there's a slide there about this sex detective thing. Again, looking for those exquisite details. Uh, this is Michael Perlman, and you'll see his work in a couple slides. But there's Jack Annan's Plicit model. And, and the letters there, uh, permission, limited information, specific suggestions, and intensive therapy are often used as a way of delineating scope of practice, like who can go how far. Sexuality educators can certainly do a lot of permission giving and talk about pleasure and teach about uh, uh, sexual uh, aids, uh, toys, and things like that. Uh, sexuality counselors are often medical professionals, nurse practitioners, or uh, pelvic floor physical therapists who can do a little bit more, as can educators, with limited information, describing changes in sexual response, aging, pregnancy, menopause. Isn't this ironic? So the long list of disciplines I, I alluded to before. Uh, the top of my list of, of just unbelievable uh, frustration is obstetrics, right? Because if you think about it, what is the one thing that makes people obstetric patients in the first place? It's sex, right? Without sex, people would never become obstetric patients. Then why is sex so typically avoided during pregnancy, around labor and delivery, and even after uh, leaving the hospital with the baby. People are usually told, uh, you know, go, good luck, enjoy your new baby, and oh, by the way, no sex for six weeks. And no explanation giving, given to what that means. Maybe they should say no intercourse for six weeks, especially if there was an episiotomy that needs to heal or until she feels she's ready, but by all means, stay close, maintain an erotic relationship. Don't as one couple came to me several years ago and said, we really, really need help, we're pregnant and we don't want to turn into our parents. And I thought that was like, thank you, that was like a gift from the sex therapy gods. Uh, and of course, intensive therapy, that's our uh, wheelhouse as psychotherapists. When there's uh, abuse issues or again, some of those more psychodynamic uh, um, well, I'll say baggage, for lack of a better word. This is uh, Michael Perlman, who worked with Helen Kaplan and happens to supervise my supervisor and mentor. Um, took Helen's uh, regulation model and came up with this sexual tipping point. And it's basically saying the same thing. We have the uh, balance at rest, and then we see either turn-ons or turn-offs psychological uh, and physiological, as well as cultural and relational. If it's a turn on, it tilts this way. If it's a turn off, it tilts the other. And then in the next slide, 
he goes on to add, uh, of course, this is uh, something that Masters and Johnson had not uh, considered, the idea of combination treatment, where you have, uh, um, you know, you're, you're putting a thumb on the scale to tip towards the uh, um, excitement side of things with both talk therapy and um, medical treatments as well. And there's a lot of research on this. You can see it, it's not a surprise, I'm sure, but you can see like bar graphs where uh, this much uh, is uh, effectiveness for Viagra, this much for talk therapy, and Viagra and talk therapy combined is this much, right? And we all understand that makes perfect sense. However, there is one thing we tend to ignore is what about the tops of those bars? What about the folks for whom none of those things work? What do we do, say? Sorry, goodbye and good luck. Uh, two words that I never thought I would see together were put on the screen at a conference, at the opening plenary session of a conference, and 600 minds were just collectively blown at once. The words were palliative sexology. And of course, everybody thought palliative. Doesn't that mean like end of life care, hospice care? Um, but uh, the, the physician who said it said, uh, yeah, and, right? It could also be any kind of um, uh, medical issue or, or uh, uh, aging factors, anything that can help uh, push things in the wrong direction, right? And some overview points before we get into the specific diagnoses. I think uh, we're going to have to speed things up a little bit, and I want to leave time for questions. Um, as I said, often there is an organic uh, basis, but there's always psychological factors. Again, that guy who's told his erectile dysfunction is because he's obese and diabetic and hypertensive is not going to go, oh, whew, what a relief. He's still going to feel horrible about it, and there's still going to be room for us. And the good news for sexual medicine is the, the, the growing recognition that sex is a quality of life issue. Even, uh, you know, the cardiologist who's treating a guy post heart attack who's saying, Doc, I'm really afraid of, uh, you know, my, my partner wants to resume sex and I'm afraid I'm going to have another heart attack. Cardiologists in the past could have been dismissive and say, Come on, I just, I saved your life. Don't worry about such insignificant things. Well, now we realize they're not so insignificant. And I'm sure there are plenty of guys that would rather they did not have their life saved if it meant they can't have sex anymore. Uh, and we'll see this towards the end, this idea that sexual dysfunction often signals underlying disease. I, I'll, I won't offer any explanation at this point. Um, everybody okay? Still with me? Any questions? Feel free to let Diana know. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep pressing Dr. on. Siegel, so sorry to interrupt you, but we actually do have a few questions if you want to go over them now or wait sure. until the end. That would, yes, that would be great. Okay. So the first question that I have here says, do you consider pornography consumption a psychosocial issue? For example, hyposexual response with partner, but able to achieve orgasm alone with pornography? Oh, so, okay, unable to with a partner, but, but able to alone. Yes, that's very, very common. And I do have to say, although this, this might generate some strong reactions from some in our audience, that in my view, it's never about the porn. Uh, I, I really believe that part of the reason why we have such an obsession with porn in the culture these days is that we're still too, um, a little too immature and embarrassed to talk about masturbation. That's truly the issue. I can tell you in, in now almost 30 years of practice, I have met exactly one young man who literally looked at porn. Otherwise, we use that expression euphemistically, looking at porn, the same way we talk about sleeping together, uh, where we kind of assume there's other activities going on. Um, porn can be uh, certainly, you know, it's not new, but with the advent of the internet, uh, uh, we have now had a 20 year, 20 plus year experiment in, in uh, what would happen if we had 
24-7 unfettered access to high quality streaming pornography. And people thought, you know, the world would be ending and people would be running in the streets with their hair on fire and planes would be falling out of the sky. And uh, the fact is, um, they're not, we can't say correlative. We have to be good social scientists. and We can't say that one is causing the other, but uh, one can observe that during this time of more access to porn than ever before, we've seen a considerable decline in sex offenses and sex crimes and even divorce rates. Now, it certainly is a problem for a couple if uh, someone is, you know, complaining of la lack of desire or rejecting their partner's uh, uh, attempts at initiating and then waiting for their partner to fall asleep so they can go sneak downstairs and log onto the computer. Uh, does that mean they're a porn addict? Not in my view. What that means is that there's some anxiety, there's some pressure, there's something unsexy going on with the couple, with the partnered sex, some expectation, some disappointment, some worry about uh, performance that simply isn't there when one is alone. When one is alone, there is, especially with uh, uh, online porn, you have high, high, unlimited arousal and practically zero performance pressure. As soon as someone is with a partner, now the performance pressure increases and may decrease the arousal. So instead of like just completely getting lost in this fantasy world, uh, one is thinking, am I good enough? Uh, do I look right? Uh, was the last partner better? Am I big enough? Am I gonna last long enough? All of this worry that makes sex more work than play. And you know, I often say it's only sex work if you're getting paid for it. And even if you're a sex worker, you're still entitled to enjoy sex and derive pleasure from it. So sex should not be work. Uh, but anxiety and performance pressure very often make it just that. Uh, so porn becomes easy, it becomes lazy, it becomes, uh, um, you know, like, like fast food. But um, when it becomes compulsive, um, since I said I don't uh, uh, ascribe to a sex addiction model, uh, the best alternative came from a book by uh, my dear friends and colleagues, Doug Braun Harvey, and Michael Vigorito, who wrote a book called Out of Control Sexual Behavior. Um, but that requires an asterisk as well, because literal out of control behavior is only seen uh, like with traumatic brain injury or sometimes uh, Parkinsonian drugs, you know, cause very high dopamine. And, and uh, when somebody's describing out of control sexual behavior, we emphasize that it feels out of control. I've had guys come to me saying, I need therapy, I'm desperate, I'm, I'm, I'm out of control, I'm a, a porn addict, I can't, uh, my masturbation's out of control, and I find out that they're masturbating once a month. And to me, that's certainly not indicative of an addiction or a compulsivity as much as guilt and a sense of doing something they feel for some value reason, some culture, some religious reason they shouldn't be doing, and um, feel guilty about it. And uh, another piece of that too that we've seen in the years of the Me Too movement is uh, unfortunately too many guys most of the time try and use as an excuse uh, some disease label that's trendy and popular uh, when the fact is they're just a cad or a, a narcissist or, or just, you know, don't care. They say, oh, uh, I'm not a serial cheater. I'm a sex addict. You can't be angry at me. You have, to have, you have to feel sorry for me. And look, I'm going to treatment to prove it, right? So a lot of these terms get thrown around and don't really have a lot of clinical uh, um, helpfulness for us. I hope I answered the question. Okay, and another question we have is, can practices like sand tray therapy be used within sex therapy? That is a fascinating question. Can sand tray therapy or other modalities be used in sex therapy? I would want to say I assume yes, but I can't answer that because I haven't personally or, or know of any sex therapists that do. One modality that I would say has been 
powerfully effective, and I've done a complete 180 in my own professional development around this, is EMDR and, and some of the other uh, trauma therapies, which can often literally make be the only thing that makes sex therapy possible. Uh, and, and even a, a born too late wannabe hippie like myself uh, used to be dismissive of EMDR until I've just seen case after case, uh, mostly through supervising uh, other therapists, uh, breakthroughs that, like I said, sex therapy would be completely impossible uh, without. So there are plenty of other modalities that dovetail beautifully uh, with sex therapy. Sand, ther sand tray therapy in particular, I can't speak to though. Okay, and the last question I have here is, any thoughts on the work of Dr. Patrick Carnes? Way too many for our uh, for the remaining time that we have. In fact, as I'm seeing it's almost four o'clock. I don't think I'm gonna be able to get through a lot of the diagnosis. Pat Carnes is not a sexologist. He's not a sex therapist. I believe he came from the criminal justice and addiction fields, wrote the book that started the field of sex addiction, I think in about 1983, right on the heels of the uh, AIDS pandemic. And um, is just not, in my opinion, a sex positive, uh, sexologically minded approach to uh, sexual problems. And again, personally, I have a hard time with labeling someone a sex addict or having any of my patients feel that their sexuality is broken or diseased or something not to be trusted or out of their control. Uh, I believe that we're obliged to be diagnosticians, to use the same, speak the same language and use the same resources like DSM, which as you know, after 30 years of trying, there is no such diagnosis of sex addiction. Uh, and uh, it's certainly not a healthy treatment to keep couples together and keep them lovers. To, my, my biggest objection to Karn's model is that it takes whatever crisis brought the couple in and freezes it into the new permanent. So now the one is labeled the sex addict, the other is labeled the partner of a sex addict, and they will never be lovers again, unless there's some kind of uh, intervention that can help them get past that crisis. And um, in my view, past those labels. So I'm afraid uh, I let our time get away from us really quickly and we're about running to wrap up time. So I'm gonna just, I will hope that the handout will be a good resource for you and just very quickly go through. Uh, I hope you're all familiar with the changes in nomenclature. I don't really have time to describe these. Uh, the sexual dysfunctions, you can see there's really not that many. We've gotten rid of clunky gynecological terms like dyspareunia and vaginismus and vulvodynia and, and in favor of this. It's clunky, but it's very helpful genitopelvic pain slash penetration disorder, uh, the paraphilias. Uh, again, we can do a whole workshop on that, but uh, obviously many of the ones that are listed are sex offenses. They, they require by definition a non-consenting partner, the voyeur, the peeping Tom, the exhibitionist or the flasher, the fraturist, the one that's rubbing up against someone in a crowded subway or some similar situation. But, you know, transvestic disorder, if I happen to have been, you know, hypothetically, what if I was wearing a little red lacy Victoria's Secret crotchless panties under my, quote, man's clothes? Uh, would that warrant me a, a psychopathological diagnosis on the same level of uh, uh, sex offenses or, or pedophilia or something? I, I certainly think not. So there's a lot of controversy uh, there as well. Uh, gender dysphoria, notice we've removed the old uh, diagnosis of gender identity, uh, what GID, gender identity dysfunction disorder, gender identity disorder. Now we just call it gender dysphoria. I don't know if any of you recognize that adorable little girl there in the picture on the right, uh, but that is Jazz Jennings, who's now a wonderful, happy, healthy teenager and has a television show of her own. She was four years old, three years old when that picture was taken. And what is especially moving to me with 
kids identifying in this way is it takes the sex out of it. So people can't say, oh, you're just a weirdo, kinky, pervert, uh, uh, you know, the way uh, transgender folks are still often uh, judged. And uh, well, I wish I had some more time, but I see it's about post time. So I will leave the uh, um, diagnoses, the remainder of the PowerPoint for your own home study. And uh, there's ways of getting in touch with me. Let's see here, there's the dysfunctions. I'm just gonna run through. And there's a slide at the end of the PowerPoint. There's a little bit on treatment there. Uh, and uh, this is just some information about Modern Sex Therapy Institutes. And I invite you to get in touch with me or my business partner, Dr. Rachel Needle in West Palm Beach. Uh, if anyone has any questions about pursuing sex therapy training or even just taking a course or two uh, uh, on working with sexual issues. And I have just enough time to thank FAMCA for doing these series and for inviting me to do this one today. I hope it was helpful, if not too uh, rushed. And uh, Diana, can we take uh, another question or two before we wrap? Actually, Dr. Siegel, um, that is all the questions that you have. And that is all the time we have as well. We hope to see you all at our next webinar titled Play Therapy Basics, Basics Entering a Child's World with Eric Davis on May 24th of 2019. For more information, you can visit FAMCA's website at www.fmhca.org. Thank you so much, Dr. Siegel, for your engaging and informing presentation. We wish everyone a happy and fulfilling weekend. See you next time.